All right, buckle up, everybody, because today we are diving deep into the mind of Alfred Jerry and specifically his wild instructions on how to construct a time machine. Oh, yes. His yeah. how to construct a time machine. Yeah, I've got to be upfront with you all. This isn't your typical how to guide. I mean, Jerry, he was the father of pataphysics, <laughs> which is like philosophy, but with a heavy dose of the absurd. A real love of the impossible. It flips logic on its head, that's for sure. And that's what makes this deep dive so much fun. Absolutely. It's like Back to the Future uh -huh. meets Alice in Wonderland. That's a good way to put it. And I am here for it. So before we get all hands on with the building, I got to know, what did Jerry even think time is? Well, for Jerry, you can't really understand time without understanding space. Mm -hmm. He saw them as, as intertwined, mm -hmm. like two sides of the same coin, you know? Yeah. He actually uses the word commensurable. Okay. Meaning you can measure them, you can compare them. It's like, just as we use spaceships right. to explore the cosmos, we could use a machine to explore the depths of time itself. I like that a lot. So I'm curious, how does he describe time? You know, what does it feel like? Does he get all Einstein and relativity on us? You know, he keeps it pretty classic at first. He compares time to a flowing stream. Sure. Pretty standard, right? Yeah. But then he throws this curveball. He says, our consciousness is actually like an obstruction in that stream. Imagine a rock in a river. Okay. Creates a kind of resistance, mm -hmm. a thickness to the water flowing around it. I see, I see. Okay, so is that where the time machine comes in? Mm. To like remove that obstruction, let us flow freely with time? Precisely. Yeah. The purpose of the machine is to isolate the traveler from duration, from that kind of drag that time exerts on us. He even uses real physics terms, talks about a minimal impulse needed to counteract that drag. Wow. It's like he's using real physics to explain a totally absurd idea, hmm. which is brilliant, I got to say. So, OK, color me intrigued. If we are going to build this thing, what are the must haves? What are yeah. the features that are going to break us free from time's grip? OK, so Jerry has three non-negotiables. First, the machine needs absolute rigidity okay. and elasticity. Both. Both. Mm -hmm. It has to be solid enough to pass through anything. Yeah but also flexible enough to navigate the currents of time. That's quite the paradox. So it's tough and bendy. What else? Second, it has to have weight. Right. <laughs> Makes sense, yeah. right? You want it to stay put. Yeah. But here's the catch. It also has to be incapable of falling, even if the ground beneath it disappears. Right. I mean, imagine it just plummeting through the earth. Yeah, not the arrival I had in mind. So what's number three? The machine has got to be completely non-magnetic. And there's a fascinating reason for this which we'll get into later when we talk about his thoughts on light and time. Okay, the suspense is killing me. But before we get lost in all the physics of it all, I have to know, what does this machine look like? I mean, is it all chrome and blinking lights? Uh, not quite. Jerry was thinking something a little more elegant, almost old world, you know? Okay. He talks about an ebony frame, kind of like an antique bicycle with a couple of fittings. I like it. Quartz components. And get this. He even includes gyrostats. Gyro what now? Gyrostats. Okay, you're going to have to break that one down for me. They're basically spinning flywheels that maintain their orientation no matter what. Think of them like those spinning tops we played with as kids. Okay. But way fancier and with a very specific purpose in the time machine. I'm picturing it, these super stable spinning tops, but why are they so crucial for time travel? What do gyrostats have to do with all this? Well, to understand that, we have to go back to Jari's starting point. Yeah. This concept of the luminiferous ether. Oh, okay. It was this theoretical medium that scientists used to believe filled all of space. <sighs> and they thought it allowed light to travel. Right, that rings a bell. But didn't they debunk the ether theory? They did, eventually. But Jari, he was really intrigued by the idea of a substance that was both rigid and penetrable, which... You know, fits his description of the time machine, right? Yeah. However, the ether didn't meet all his criteria, especially that whole non-magnetic rule. Uh-huh. Okay, so that's where the gyrostats come in. They provide the stability and rigidity without the magnetic interference. Exactly. And they have this fascinating ability to resist changes in orientation, which is perfect for Jerry's idea of isolating oneself from the flow of time. Hmm. It's like they're creating a bubble of stillness within the machine. Wow. Okay, so if we're picturing this thing, we've got the ebony frame, the quartz bits and bobs, and these spinning gyrostats holding it all together. But how does it actually work? How do you steer this thing through time? That, my friend, is where things get really interesting. Because Jerry's idea of time travel is, let's say, unique. Okay. 
To move into the future, you have to slow down your experience of duration. In other words, you make time pass more slowly for you than the outside world. So the faster the machine moves through time, the slower time feels for the person inside. Yeah, it's a real mind bender. It is. So to go back in time, you'd have to, what, speed up? You got it. Yeah. To go backward, you need to speed up your experience of duration. Mm -hmm. Imagine watching an apple fall from a tree, but in reverse. Whoa, my brain is doing somersaults. <laughs> okay, but before we get too lost in the mechanics, I'm curious about Jury's bigger picture. You know, how does he actually envision time itself? Like, what shape does time take in his pataphysical world? Oh, that's a great question. And Jari's answer is both poetic and mind-boggling. He sees time not as a straight line, but as a closed curve, like a sphere. A loop. So like those ancient cyclical views of time where history repeats itself. There are definitely echoes of that. Yeah. But he takes it a step further by introducing the concept of the imaginary present. The imaginary present. Yeah, it's his midpoint between the past and the future, a place that only a time traveler could experience. Wow. Okay, I'm starting to see why Jari's work is considered so mind-bending. It's not just a blueprint. It's like a whole new way of thinking about time itself. Exactly. And in true pataphysical fashion, he sums up his whole theory of duration with this wonderfully concise definition. Yeah. Okay, I'm on the edge of my seat. What is it? He says, and I quote, Duration is the transformation of succession into reversion. In other words, the becoming of a memory. Whoa, that's that's beautiful and strangely profound. I need a minute to let that sink in. It's a lot to take in. It is. But that's the beauty of Jerry. He just forces us to rethink everything we thought we knew about time, reality, existence. Well, he certainly does that. So now that we've got a grasp of Jerry's uh, unique perspective on time, let's look at how he imagined navigating it with his time machine. I, for one, can't wait to explore the nuts and bolts, or I guess the ebony and quartz, of this incredible contraption. So we've explored Jerry's uh, pretty wild view of time. Now let's take a closer look at the time machine itself. Yeah, let's get into the nitty gritty. What did he imagine turning these crazy ideas into? Well, he envisioned this frame made of ebony, you know, like a really fancy old school bicycle uh. with copper fittings for strength. Thanks, Dirty. And those gyrostats we talked about, the spinning wonders. Mm -hmm. They're also ebony encased in copper. Mounted on these rods of, get this, a tightly rolled quartz ribbons. Wait, hold on. Quartz ribbons? That sounds incredibly fragile for something that's supposed to, you know, travel through time. They're actually surprisingly strong. Uh. And remember how Jerry said the machine needs to be both rigid and elastic? Right, right. Well, quartz fits that bill perfectly. It's also very resistant to changes in temperature and pressure, which, you know, would be pretty important for something traversing the vast unknowns of time. Yeah, that makes sense. What else is on the material list? Well, Jari specifically states that there's no iron anywhere in the machine. Yeah. Except for the soft iron used in the electromagnets. It's all about minimizing magnetic interference, remember? Right. Iron is super magnetic. That would totally mess with the time machine's non-magnetic vibe. Yeah. It all comes back to Jari's theory. So how does this thing actually move through time? What's the engine he envisioned? Believe it or not, he went with a classic electric motor, powered by batteries, stored under the seat. Okay. He even talks about ratchet boxes, quartz wire chain drives, and cog wheels. I'm picturing a steampunk masterpiece. All whirring gears and spinning wheels? Quite the image. Can you, uh, can you translate that into something I can understand? Basically, he imagined a system that would translate the motor's energy into the precise movements needed to navigate through time. And it wasn't just the engine. He designed a whole system of levers and dials to track and control the journey. So it's pretty hands-on. No autopilot on this time machine. Not exactly. He had this lever connected to a pulley system that activates with each turn of the front wheel. And that lever moves these four ivory dials okay. that record how far you've traveled in time, whether it's days, thousands, millions, even hundreds of millions of years. A time-traveling odometer. I like it. Keeping track of every temporal mile. What about steering? How do you control the direction? Well, for that, he envisioned two handles. One controls the motor speed, letting you accelerate or decelerate. The other handle actually slows the machine's advancement, which is how you'd return from the future to the present. Hold on. To get back to your starting point, you have to slow down. That seems counterintuitive. Shouldn't you speed up to get back to the present? It does seem that way, right? But remember, we're talking about slowing down your experience of duration not your actual speed through space. Right, right. It all comes back to manipulating your perception of time. So yeah. we've got the ebony frame, the gyrostats, the motor, a set of dials, and these handles to control speed. Anything else? 
What if you need to make a pit stop in time? He thought of that too. He even included a lever to lock the brakes, allowing you to stop at any point in time. Wow, he really did think of everything. But I gotta say, all this talk about gears and dials is making my head spin. What I really want to know is what the actual experience would be like. You know, what would it feel like to ride in this thing? Now that's where things get really interesting. And we'll dive into that right after this quick break. Okay, so back to Jerry's time machine and what it would actually feel like to travel through time in this thing. Well, it wouldn't be like anything you've ever experienced before. Remember those gyrostats constantly spinning, creating that... Uh, that cubic rigidity. Oh, absolutely. Those spinning wonders seem to be the key to everything. Exactly. Jari believed they essentially make the machine transparent to the normal passage of time. You know, it's not just about moving through time. It's about existing outside of time's normal flow. Okay, I'm trying to visualize that. So if the time machine is outside of time, wouldn't that make all journeys instantaneous? I mean, if no time is passing for the traveler, wouldn't a million years feel the same as a minute? That's precisely what Jari suggests. For the person inside the time machine, no time elapses during a voyage, no matter how long it is for the outside world. The only duration they experience is that tiny bit of friction we talked about, that minimal resistance from inertia. Whoa, so you could literally travel billions of years into the future and it would feel like no time had passed at all. It really challenges our understanding of time, doesn't it? Yeah, it's uh, mind-blowing and a little terrifying, to be honest. It does make you think. Mm. But it all ties back to how Jerry imagined moving through time in the first place. Right. Remind me, it was something about slowing down and speeding up, wasn't it? It always felt a little counterintuitive to me. It is. A bit. He proposed that the machine always moves toward the future when it's set in motion. He saw the future as the natural progression of events, like an apple falling from a tree. Okay, yeah. The past, on the other hand, is the reverse. The apple moving upwards back onto the branch. Like rewinding a film. Exactly. So if the future is forward, the past is backward, where does the present fit into all of this? Jerry argued that the present is practically non-existent, just a tiny fraction of a phenomenon smaller than an atom. So the time machine isn't really traveling through time. It's more like shifting your perspective on the order of events. You got it. And to achieve that shift, Jerry said the machine's immobility in time needs to be directly proportional to the speed of those spinning gyrostats. The faster they spin, the more the machine is detached from the normal flow of time. It's like they're fighting against the current, holding the time machine still. So how do you actually control the direction, make it go forward or backward? Well, he used a mathematical analogy to explain this. Yeah. If T represents the future, then the speed in space or the slowness of duration, which he represents as V, must be less than t to travel into the future. v less than t equals future travel. Got it. And to go back in time, v would need to be greater than t. Not quite. To journey into the past, v needs to be less than negative t. You're not just exceeding the speed of time, you're reversing it. Ah, right. The inverse order of events. That's where it gets tricky for me. So with all this talk of past and future, does the time machine ever experience the present? Jerry proposed something really interesting here. He said that because the machine can only reach the real past by passing through the future, it must pass through a point that's symmetrical to our present, kind of midpoint between future and past. A midpoint in time. It's like a hidden dimension. Exactly. And he called this point. Go on. The imaginary present. The imaginary present. Wow. It's like a secret portal in time, only accessible to someone in the time machine. Exactly. And it connects to Jari's view of time as a closed curve, that eternity we talked about. Right. From inside the time machine, time wouldn't stretch out in front and behind. It would actually curve and loop back on itself. Like a circle. Or even a sphere. Exactly. That's a wild visual. Jerry was a radical thinker, there's no doubt about it. He really was. And it all comes back to his definition of duration. The transformation of succession into reversion. The becoming of a memory. From the perspective of someone in the time machine, with time looping back on itself, the past really does become a kind of memory, constantly accessible, constantly present. It collapses the distance between everything. I think I'm starting to understand Jerry's vision. It is beautiful and brilliant and, yes, a little mad. It really is. But that's the power of pataphysics. It encourages us to question, to explore the absurd, to see the world in a new way. I think Jari would be thrilled that we're still talking about his ideas over a century later. His work is still sparking our imaginations. Absolutely. 
So tell me, if you could build a time machine just like Jari envisioned, where would you go? And what would you look for in the shape of time itself? That's a question I'm going to be thinking about for a long time. Thanks for taking us on this journey into the mind of Alfred Jari. It's been amazing. It's been my pleasure. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep embracing the absurd.